We live in a time of extremes, when cycles of flood, drought, and fire lead to vast humanitarian crises around the world. A time when humans are damaging the Earth's organs, the ecosystems that regulate our climate. It doesn't need to be this way. I've experienced and created landscapes stewarded by humans with an abundance of water and life, dripping with food. Here, this fruit tree is falling over with the weight of its own natural productivity, grown with no inputs, just by partnering with natural forces. In the Western world, we're really good at symptom-based medicine. If you have a runny nose, you treat the runny nose, rather than addressing the stress that is the root cause of the disease. I'm worried that right now we're doing the same thing with climate change, focusing on the symptom rather than the stress that is the root cause of the disease. Do you know how much of the global heat dynamics on Earth are regulated by carbon? Somewhere between four and 11%. How much is regulated by water? 75 to 95%. Water is the Earth's blood, the elemental building block of life. In the natural state of the landscape, the water cycle is balanced and productive. In the shade of diverse vegetation, the soil is kept cool and moist, allowing it to quickly absorb the falling rain. That water feeds into the Earth, returning as springs and creeks, keeping the water clear and cool throughout the year. Healthy rivers full of life. The sun evaporates moisture off the ocean and the water vapor drifts inland. In order to condense as clouds and fall as rain, the water vapor needs a nuclei to form around. One of the primary nuclei are hygroscopic microorganisms produced within the leaves of trees. Around these microorganisms, the water condenses into a liquid, forming clouds and then rain. As water vapor becomes liquid, it goes from very large to quite small. That phase change causes a change in pressure. Like a vacuum, it draws in more humidity from the coast. Trees respire water into the air, cooling the temperature and increasing the humidity. In the natural water cycle, Biological systems are facilitating the movement of water from the oceans through Earth's continents, a system called the biotic pump. Weather patterns are balanced and regular with water available throughout the year. In the disturbed water cycle, human impacts lead to extremes. On the hot, exposed soil, the water can no longer infiltrate. Like over a dry sponge, it runs quickly downhill, leading to flooding and erosion, followed by drought, and in the worst case is fire. Columns of hot air begin rising off the exposed earth, creating high pressure systems. As the humidity from the coast tries to enter, the hot air pushes back, causing the pressure to build. Eventually the force overwhelms and its power is destructive. During the short, intense storms, there's a little opportunity for the soil to absorb the moisture. This leads to stronger, more intense storms with longer periods of drought in between. Without the precipitation nuclei, the water vapor forms a warming haze. Like a blanket, it prevents the heat from dissipating to the night sky. This is how humid deserts are created. So let's take a look at where we're at from a global analysis of our water budget. The prognosis is not good. Over the last 10,000 years, humans have desertified one third of Earth's land. How did this happen? How could such a relatively small organism create such a tremendous impact? Well, about 10 to 12,000 years ago in the Middle East, humans invented the plow and domesticated animals. With these two inventions, extractive agriculture began. Humans, for the first time, had a powerful ability to change the vegetative cover of the earth and keep it changed. Slowly, this technology moved around the world, creating deserts in its wake. First, the Middle East, which may be hard to believe now, but was once one of the most fertile valleys in the world. Then northern Africa, six to 8,000 years ago, turning the rich Saharan savanna into the desert it is today. It continued to move around the world, even claiming the American West. On this map here, you see most of the brown areas used to be green before human impacts changed how water cycles through the landscape. But we face an even greater challenge now, urban development and the vast creation of hardscapes and draining of valleys. Here in this picture on the right is Bogota in Colombia, 
but it could be nearly any city in the world. Everything you see in that picture, all of the buildings, the roads, it's all designed to drain the water away as quickly as possible. And not only that, but the city is in the bottom of a valley. The surrounding mountains feed their water into that valley, and so that water is drained as well. How can we begin to rebalance our water budget? By creating decentralized water retention landscapes, holding water within the earth, rehydrating the body with blood. Let me show you some of what is possible. Here's a community in Portugal, Tamara, living in a harsh, desertified landscape with severe water shortages. Here is the water retention landscape that was created there. It's important to note this is done using natural materials and seasonal rains, the resources that nature freely provides. How is a transition like that possible? Well, I'm truly standing on the shoulders of a giant, this man, Sepp Holzer, who through a lifetime of learning from and working with nature, sees not just the landscape as it is, but the ecological potential. And through experience, he knows how to realize that potential. Here's another project in Montana where we took a heavily degraded wetland after a couple weeks' work and a couple months of natural processes. Here is the ecological oasis it became. There's a growing movement of people around the world implementing these solutions. From what I've seen, once humans know what is possible, they don't just walk but begin running in this direction. How can we know what is possible? Well, one way is by looking into the past. This tree, Big Mama, was alive on Turtle Island before Columbus arrived. When she was young, you could drink from any body of water in North America. Recently, I read a report that in the Minnesota portion of the Missouri River Basin, they found that no lake met the state's quality standards for swimmable or fishable. Think about that for a moment. From drinkable water everywhere to entire watersheds that aren't even swimmable or fishable. In some ways, I feel as though in our rapid adoption of reductionistic science, we lost all true understanding of the world. We reduced things down to the simplest terms so that we can more easily describe the complicated, but in the process, we lose sight of the whole. In some ways, as science advances, it is just starting to catch up with traditional ecological knowledge. An example of this, it's common knowledge in indigenous cultures throughout the world that the forests call rain. Western science thought this was preposterous, that forests grow in regions with high precipitation, and this is why these people get so confused. But now the most advanced science is learning that indeed the forests do call the rain. They're producing the hygroscopic microorganisms that seed rainfall, accommodating for as much as 80% of the rain in the Amazon basin. Now if we look at the Amazon for a moment and consider that, if we cut all the trees at once, it wouldn't just become a savanna, it would actually become a desert. The amount of precipitation would reduce by 80%. We need to carefully consider if we want the Amazon to remain a forest or become a desert, and the impacts will not just be felt by the people of Amazonia. This basin acts as the biotic pump feeding moisture through the rest of the South American continent. If the forests disappear, so will the rainfall patterns in other regions. Not only that, but as land is cleared, columns of hot air begin rising and increases the pressure along the Atlantic coast. Some of these storms are pushed off in other directions, leading to catastrophic flooding events in other regions. My plea to you is this. Help rehydrate the Earth's body with blood. Hold water within the landscape, not just for you and your children, but for life. For water is life. Stand up for yourself, for our brothers and sisters, the living beings with which we share this planet. A future of climate extreme, natural disaster, scarcity and crisis, or a future of balance, abundance, health and prosperity. It's not a matter of chance, it's a matter of choice. So my question to you is simple. Which future will you help create? Thank you. <laughs>